So the key concepts in my paper are cosmopolitanism and communication rights. The one informs the other. Communication is intrinsic to cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitanism underpins the notion of communication rights. And those are the right to be informed, the right to inform, the right to privacy, and the right to participate uh, in public communication, which I've operationalized in, in my research um, as in part, the right to be represented, the right to have a voice, the right to be seen. As with all human rights, these rights are said to apply equally to people everywhere, regardless of gender, ethnicity, or class. Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights protects everyone's right to freedom of expression, which includes the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds. As you may have seen in the news, uh, the definition of the freedom of expression has been tested in Sweden uh, the last week or so. <clears throat> We're not gonna talk about that. UNESCO and other actors at the global level have been banging on about these rights for half a century. Some of you might remember talk of a new world information order and the debate over media representation over what was then called the developing world in the 1970s and early 80s. But the question um, that I want to ask is what they mean in a post-digital context, or perhaps in the context of hybrid media systems, which is the term Andrew Chadwick uses for what I suspect might be the same sort of thing. In the Tashkent Declaration of September 2022, UNESCO acknowledges that information today is increasingly produced, distributed, accessed, and maintained in digital form, and that the internet and digital platforms thereby play an important role in creating an enabling environment for the right to access information. Okay, but what do universal communication rights mean in a world where millions are displaced and thus lack what Aaron called the right to have rights? To be fair, the declaration expresses concern about the persistent divides in society in terms of exercising the right of access to information to the detriment of women and youth, as well as indigenous people, persons with disabilities and other marginalized groups. That was a quote. And it promises to do something about that, to empower key actors with a view to ensuring that fundamental freedoms are guaranteed online and offline, and to empower citizens and their fundamental freedoms through the development of skills and environments for media pluralism and diversity. I agree with UNESCO um, that the cosmopolitan ideal of communication rights has been challenged by technological developments and what's not to like about its promises and ambitions. To be honest, however, I find the generalizing, universalizing nature of the philosoph philosophical regulatory discourse on these rights to be problematic. What does it even mean? And in moments of particular desperation, I find myself thinking of the disheartening scene at the end of that terrifying dystopian film, Brazil. I don't know if anyone has seen it. Um, in this final scene, the figure played by Robert De Niro, who's supposed to save everyone, meets his end. It's Friday afternoon, and this is the last paper, so I thought I might be permitted to share it. Uh, <clears throat> so you have the, the, the desperate hero there, delighted to see Robert De Niro rushing to his aid. He gets covered with all these papers, and when the hero you might recognize as a young Jonathan Price there, takes all the papers away. There's nothing there under the paper. This is for me, um, an academic's anxiety dream. As how, uh, we as academics are also culpable, the scholarly literature on the relationship between journalists and audiences, for example, so between the literature on the people with the right to inform um, and the people with the right to information, in my view, it also tends to be characterized by generalizations, not least when it comes to how the relationship is affected by algorithms. And it seems to me this does not often fit well with empirical realities on the ground. And without wanting to sound too petulant, as someone who studies global media, by which I mean journalism aimed at global audiences, not journalism in many different countries, 
This scholarship can be too specific as well as too general. Britt has already mentioned um, methodological nationalism, and in fact, I think it was mentioned at the very first keynote last week. In previous work, I've argued that journalism that might be thought to contribute to a cosmopolitan outlook has to do with understanding, it has to do with narrative knowledge as opposed to information. Um, the Anglo-Saxon ideal of objective information relay that has long dominated our way of thinking is something that I would actually uh, put in opposition to narrative knowledge. And even though there's plenty of evidence that objectivity has always been a mirage um, and has become even more elusive in an age of information warfare and disinformation, this ideal is like a zombie. It just won't stay down. Um, so, okay, let's leave understanding and engagement aside for a moment and let's go with information instead. I can do that. But what is it? What is information in a post-digital setting? And how is it to be distinguished from data? And what about its free flow? Do we really want that? This is one of the voices that can be heard at gatherings of tech activists um, like RightsCon. I think it's a helpful problematization of the elision between information, knowledge, and data. It's a long quote, so I'm not going to read the whole thing um, out. In fact, I'm going to go straight to the next slide. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with uh, RightsCon, um, it's an annual summit. Its participants refer to it uh, often as a summit associated with an NGO called Access Now, which fights for human rights in the digital age by combining technical support with policy engagement. And it focuses on privacy, freedom of expression, digital security, and net discrimination. The year that a young colleague and I monitored RightsCon, there were almost 8,000 participants from 158 countries. So RightsCon is one place you can go if you want to learn about empirical realities on the ground and see how they fit with the universalizing and often abstract discourse on communication rights. So what can we learn about the right to privacy in post-digital settings by listening to tech experts at RightsCon? One thing we can learn is that the right to information and the right to privacy are entangled, and that the question of whose rights prevail is contested, although perhaps not as much as it should be. The right to information is something at the heart of big tech's business model, namely its right to information about us. Um, what's described here in the quote on, on the slide is, is something we all know, of course, um, even if we carry on providing that information free of charge to the tech giants. But what people tend to be less aware of is that Google and Facebook hired expensive lawyers back in the day to commodify something that wasn't a commodity in the first place, giving them legal right to our information. We do have a choice, uh, those of us in the Zoom space, especially those of us who live under GDPR, but many people, many parts of the world actually don't have a choice. Uh, emerging digital technologies such as biometric data systems and predictive analytics tend to compound existing inequities, make things worse. People's right to privacy is not just violated by global capital. It's also violated by governments everywhere um, here uh, in the North, um, but perhaps especially in the global South. Countries like India have nation building narratives and a very deliberate strategy to see the data of its citizens as national resources, saying all of it is owned by the state. So people are expected to sacrifice their privacy for the collective, the collective good. But it's also threatened by the well-meaning, um, by humanitarians and social workers, um, for example. What I learned about the right to privacy in post-digital settings by listening to tech experts at RightsCon is that it's a first world privilege and luxury to even be talking in such terms. Not everyone has the luxury of insisting on privacy. If you're already invisible, and risk being excluded from the resources that will keep your family fed and healthy, how valuable actually is the right to privacy? So it's a matter of unequal conditions within state boundaries, um, but of course it's also a matter of unequal conditions in a global context. So be it the universal rights referred to in abstract policy declarations, 
or radical proposals made by tech activists from the global north in general and Silicon Valley in particular, that individuals should be able to sell or not sell data by, um, about themselves as they choose. Such discourse is out of sync with the empirical realities of really marginalized groups. The voices raised at RightsCon were themselves appropriated as data by me uh, and my research colleagues as part of a project on informational inequality. The point of departure of the project is that what we get from our news media is never just information. Obviously, there's a play on words there. Um, the point of departure is that information to a democracy is like drinking water to a human body. You need it to survive, but if it's polluted, you get sick and it can lead to death. Um, but there's also an idea here that as just with human health, um, the health of democracy, technological advances can be a boon or a bane. Um, it's a double-edged sword. The project has three component parts. What I've used up most of my time talking about relates to the third part, voices from civil society. What I've spent most of my uh, funded time doing is uh, working on the first part, analyzing global news representations of inequality. And what I want to do with my last few minutes is to acknowledge that there is an alternative perspective on the post-digital that comes across when you talk to journalists about whether technology helps or hinders, whether it's a boon or a bane, uh, which is one of the questions that came up in the second part of the project. This was an interview study guided um, by this question. How do news professionals who report uh, to global publics, but also to national um, outlets with international reach, how do they perceive social and informational inequality? And what responses do they deem feasible and appropriate? <clears throat> When it comes to the right to inform in a hybrid media environment or post-digital setting, a lot of journalism scholarship tells us that technological developments actually improve the capacities of journalists. So algorithms, analytics, and AI help reporters do their jobs better. For example, by holding the powerful to account in ways that were previously impossible through digital investigative journalism. The Panama Papers is a classic example. On the other side, we have the critics who see algorithms increasingly deciding what audiences will know about the news and what journalists know about the audience. And, and they're concerned that this deprives both journalists and audiences of agency. So the critical view is that it's less a matter of knowledge in the interests of the audience and more a matter of surveillance in the interests of capitalism. And of course, also the view that such technological developments will reinforce social inequities. We turn to two different sorts of news professionals to find out how they experience and perceive these tensions. One was audience developers, so professionals who analyze, interpret, and act on audience data. And the other was journalists whose work focus on social inequality. In a nutshell, we found that audience developers can and do use data to improve journalists' understanding of the diverse information needs of their audiences. So their use of our data tells them what news reaches which parts of the audience and in what form. Uh, and this, you could argue, matters both to the right to be informed and the right to participate in public communication. The journalists, on the other hand, emphasize that good storytelling remains as important as computation and that representation not only matters as much as metrics, but that the two are intrinsically linked. It's the journalists on the ground who form relationships with sources from diverse backgrounds, who give a voice to the voiceless in some of the outlets that we engaged with, who are able to directly address inequality in representation. Given my critical views on abstraction, I feel I should offer at least one example, eye on the clock all the time. Um, one of our interviewees who worked for the BBC said the World Service, run as it is from London, has historically had a London view of the internet. And the London view was that Facebook is where, it at, where it's at for video. But when they looked more closely at the data it had been collecting on its audience, it turned out that in India, people don't use Facebook. They watch video on YouTube. And as you can see from the excerpt on the slide, things are quite different in Nigeria. What he wanted to say with this story and all you're going to get from me today on method is that I use narrative analysis. Um, 
is that there are power asymmetries that are reinforced through platforms and that platforms shape the journal audience relationship. These asymmetries obviously have consequences for communication rights. The example is also a reminder of why we need a global perspective to interrogate these issues. To the extent that I have a take home message, it's that there are valuable insights to be gained from specific expert perspectives grounded in individual experience. In other words, we need to dig down and move away from universalisms and generalities and abstractions. At the same time, or on the other hand, we need to look up and think about inequality in a global and not just a national or comparative perspective. That said, I do still want to hold on to the concept of communication rights because, it, because without it, it's difficult to connect the dots, to connect the experiences and perspectives of regulators at the global level, journalists who've shouldered the task of giving a voice to the voiceless, news professionals who engage with audiences that are not defined by their national moorings, the people with the tech savvy to know where technological development can lead us, and who meet to discuss a way forward that's in keeping with the cosmopolitan worldview, however defined, and us, whether our primary identity is that of scholar or simply inhabitants of a post-digital world. A thought to take us out into our Friday evenings is whether either or even both of those identities is enough. So I'd like to give the last word to a person from the other end of the planet from me, Herman Wasserman, a South African professor. This quote from something he wrote in 2019 pulls these many threads together nicely, I think. Where superficial debate, voyeurism, mining of data and extreme speech threaten to overshadow the potential of new platforms to make connections, foster community and provide alternative perspectives, the monitorial detached stance is not an adequate ethical response. Thank you.